Good day, and welcome to the PAR Pacific Second Quarter 2023 Earnings Call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key, followed by zero, on your telephone keypad. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star, then one, on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Ashimi Patel, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome to PAR Pacific's second quarter earnings conference call. Joining me today are William Pate, Chief Executive Officer, Will Monteleone, President, Sean Flores, SVP and Chief Financial Officer, and Richard Creamer, EVP of Refining and Logistics. Before we begin, note that our comments today may include forward-looking statements. Any forward-looking statements are subject to change and are not guarantees of future performance or events. They are subject to risks and uncertainties, and actual results may differ materially from these forward-looking statements. Accordingly, investors should not place undue reliance on forward-looking statements, and we disclaim any obligation to update or revise them. I refer you to our investor presentation on our website and to our filings with the SEC for non-GAAP reconciliations and additional information. I'll now turn the call over to our Chief Executive Officer, William Pape. Thank you, Ashimi, and uh, good morning to our conference call participants. This quarter was an exciting period in our company's growth. We made progress on many strategic objectives and reported excellent financial results. Second quarter adjusted EBITDA was $151 million and adjusted net income was $1.73 per share. While the market continues to be supportive of our business, our financial results were attributable to solid commercial and operational execution at each of our business units. We closed the Billings acquisition on June 1st and welcomed the PAR Montana team to our organization. Initial performance has been very strong, with June operational and financial results well above our acquisition forecast. As previously noted, success in Billings depends on improving reliability. Our confidence is growing that the Billings refinery will exceed our acquisition case, which assumed 50,000 barrels per day of throughput. The PAR Montana team has identified numerous projects to improve mechanical integrity, utility and infrastructure improvements, and other important elements of reliability. These are generally small capital, high return projects. The June results demonstrate that improved reliability drives significant site profitability. We also made considerable progress on our renewables initiative. The Hawaii Distillate Hydro Treater Conversion Project is progressing well and we continue to advance engineering on the Tacoma SAF Green Hydrogen Project. The third quarter is shaping up to be another strong quarter. Global inventories tightened in July due to solid demand for refined products. As a result, market cracks have been improving throughout the first half of this quarter. We're also benefiting from growing local demand. Our retail units posted exceptional same-store sales growth during the second quarter illustrating the strength of our franchises and overall market growth. June 30th liquidity of $464 million reflects a strong capital structure. During the quarter, we were able to fund the Billings acquisition with cash on hand and availability from our new asset-backed loan facility. Since the closing, we have steadily reduced our debt and rebuilt our liquidity. Before Will covers our commercial and operational performance in more detail, I also want to note that the Board of Directors has authorized management to repurchase up to $250 million of common stock. At this stage in our company's evolution, we will use this authority opportunistically as we have sufficient liquidity to achieve our ambitious growth objectives while also repurchasing common stock at attractive prices. I'll now turn the call over to Will. Thank you, Bill. The refining and logistics business units delivered a strong quarter executing planned maintenance efficiently and achieving excellent throughput. The combined throughputs of Hawaii, Washington, and Wyoming resulted in record quarterly throughput of 142,000 barrels per day. In addition, the Billings team delivered a strong initial contribution with total crude charge of nearly 63,000 barrels per day for the month of June. In Hawaii, the second quarter throughput increased 84,000 barrels per day, and production costs were $4.33 per barrel. The Singapore index averaged $13.72 per barrel during the quarter, and our landed crude differential 
was $5.29, slightly better than our guidance. This resulted in a combined index of $8.43 per barrel. Capture to the combined index was approximately 143%, reflecting continued price lag benefit in a following crude price environment, favorable freight rates, low levels of backwardation, and a modest product crack hedge benefit. <clears throat> in Washington, second quarter throughput was 41,000 barrels per day, and production costs were $3.98 per barrel. The P&W index averaged $25 per barrel during the quarter. Capture declined to 25%, reflecting a greater than $5 per barrel tightening of WCS crude differentials during the period, as well as asphalt and VGO weakness. In Wyoming, second quarter throughput was 17,000 barrels per day, and production costs were $8.30 per barrel, slightly elevated due to minor plan maintenance. The U.S. Gulf Coast Index was $21.65 per barrel during the quarter. Wyoming capture was approximately 95% including a negative FIFO impact of $3 million, but partially offset by Rockies regional strength. And finally, Montana production costs settled $8.07 per barrel, reflecting the strong June throughput. Like our Wyoming location, we plan to use the U.S. Gulf Coast Index as a benchmark for the Montana location. That index averaged $23.20 over the course of June, and capture was 134%, reflecting strong regional Rockies differentials to the Gulf Coast. Like Wyoming, Montana capture is highly seasonal. Looking ahead to the third quarter, we expect Hawaii to run between 83 and 88,000 barrels per day, Montana between 52 and 57, Washington between 40 and 42, and Wyoming between 17 and 19,000 barrels per day. Due to unplanned downtime during July of our Hawaii reformer unit, we expect a margin impact of $1.50 to $2 per barrel. We expect our third quarter Hawaii crude differential to average between $5 and $5.50 per barrel, approximately flat to the prior quarter. In total, we expect system-wide throughput of approximately 200,000 barrels per day, or 92% utilization. The retail segment generated another strong financial quarter with growing fuel volumes and expanding merchandise revenues. Second quarter, same-store sales fuel volumes and merchandise revenue ramped up nicely, growing 11% and 12% respectively versus the 2022 levels. These same-store sales reflect rebounding Hawaii economic activity, as well as the growing strength of our Hele and Nam Nam brands. <clears throat> the successful execution of the Billings transaction reflects months of planning and coordination. I'd like to congratulate and thank the entire PAR Montana and PAR Pacific team for driving a well-planned operational integration. We pride ourselves on crisp integrations, and this was another great team effort. Our initial time on the ground in Montana has largely confirmed our initial assessment. We believe we will optimize operations and achieve the initial synergies, as well as consistently move throughput above our baseline. With respect to our renewables initiatives, in July, we began trial runs for our Tacoma co-processing operation. The less than $2 million project reduces our RVO exposure, and we expect a less than one-year payback period. We have started fabrication on our previously announced Hawaii SAF project, and we also continue to dedicate time and resources to scope in a larger co-located green hydrogen and SAF facility at our Tacoma refinery. We expect to make a final investment decision on this project early next year. I'll now turn it over to Sean to review our financial results. <clears throat> Thank you, Will. Second quarter adjusted EBITDA and adjusted earnings were $151 million and $106 million, or $1.73 per share. The refining segment reported adjusted EBITDA of $129 million in the second quarter compared to $153 million in the first quarter. We got off to a strong start in billings, generating adjusted EBITDA of $43 million during the first month of our ownership. Our second quarter refining results include a $12 million benefit in Hawaii from price lag and product crack hedging, partially offset by a negative FIFO impact in Wyoming of $3 million. We have continued our product crack hedging framework in Hawaii with approximately 25% of our third quarter sales hedged at a $15 per barrel premium to Brent. Our logistics segment reported adjusted EBITDA of $26 million in the second quarter compared to $18 million in the first quarter. The sequential improvement was driven by increased marine throughput in Hawaii and Washington, 
and a $3 million contribution in June from the Montana Logistics System. The retail segment reported adjusted EBITDA of $18 million in the second quarter compared to $17 million in the first quarter. Through the first half of the year, our retail business has generated $35 million in adjusted EBITDA compared to $15 million during the first half of last year. As Will mentioned, our strong retail earnings were supported by growing same-store sale volumes and merchandise revenue. Corporate expenses and adjusted EBITDA were $22 million in the second quarter compared to $19 million in the first quarter. Our second quarter expenses include $3 million related to our renewables development and other one-time costs. As we advance engineering on our renewables project in Tacoma, we expect to incur an additional $2 to $3 million per quarter above our baseline corporate expense guidance of $17 and $19 million. Cash provided by operations during the second quarter totaled $173 million. Net changes in working capital resulted in a cash inflow of $88 million, primarily driven by the initial build and trade payables at Par Montana. Cash outflows from investing activities totaled $624 million. This includes $280 million for the remaining Billings base purchase price and $328 million for the Billings hydrocarbon inventory and other working capital items. Cash outflows from financing activities totaled $20 million in the quarter, driven by repayments of borrowings on our Hawaii Deferred Financing Facility. Second quarter ending liquidity was $464 million, including $191 million in cash and $273 million in availability. Concurrent with the Billings acquisition, we completed the upsides of our asset-based loan facility, increasing total bank commitments from $150 million to $600 million. Strong cash flow from operations during the quarter allowed us to pay down the ABL from $215 million on June 1st to $41 million on June 30th. Total gross debt was $595 million at the end of the second quarter, an increase of just $45 million from our pre-acquisition levels. And lastly, with the Billings acquisition closed, we are increasing our 2023 CapEx guidance by $20 million to a total of 90 to 100 million for the full year. This concludes our prepared remarks. Operator will turn it to you for Q&A. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star then 2. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Matthew Blair with TPH. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, good morning, Bill, Will, and, and Sean. How are you guys? Great. Hey, hey Matthew. Matt. Um, the initial contribution from the Billings refinery appeared quite strong, which I suppose isn't too unusual for for a June period. Um, but could you walk through the, the major drivers uh, for us? And were there any one-time benefits that, that we should be aware of? And then finally, um, when do you think the next major turnaround will be scheduled for Billings? Sure, Matt. This is Will. I'll, I'll take the operational aspects and then let Sean address some of the financial uh, components. Um, I would say overall the, the biggest drivers um, of you know strong throughputs. Uh, again, I think we were able to really run at max rates uh, through the crude unit and the uh, FCC, where we were able to feed additional crude into that unit. Uh, so again, I think saw strong uh, performance from the team there uh, right out of the gate. I think we are also, you know, an above mid-cycle margin environment for both Gulf Coast cracks as well as the Rockies regional differentials. Uh, and then ultimately the, the feedstock inputs uh, for Canadian heavy barrels as well as the, the light barrels that we run were, you know, I would say in line with our uh, acquisition model. So again, I think it was really a combination of um, strong operations from the team and above mid-cycle environment. Um, with respect to, to turnarounds, um, we do have planned turnaround activity in 2024. Uh, I'd expect it to be about a 30-day outage. I think one thing I'd point out for you and Billings that's unique is, again, even when we have uh, certain units down, we're unlikely to take total crude charge down to zero. So, again, um, we're able to feed crude to the, to the CAT unit 
Uh, and so ultimately, it's going to be a little bit different than our other facilities where we have plant-wide outages. John, do you want to take any one-time aspects or financial yep. components? Yeah, I think Will hit on most of the financial components. Matthew, I know you, you track the Rockies market pretty closely. I think we saw uh, both Rockies gasoline and diesel uh, peak in June. Both were very favorable to the Gulf Coast. Uh, they remain strong, uh, but it, it likely have peaked in June. Great, thanks for all the color. And then um, the next question might be for Bill. Um, you, you talked about raising the buyback authorization to 250 million. You mentioned it, it'd be an opportunistic approach. Could you talk about your, your current opportunity set and, and how you view it between M&A uh, buybacks and a potential dividend? Thanks. Sure, uh, Matt. We, we obviously focus on our avenues of growth first. And when we think about growth, as Will mentioned, we think there's a real opportunity just investing in reliability. You'll note that uh, we were projecting, um, you know, throughput at 92% of system capacity. By investing in reliability over time, we think we can get that number up. There's opportunities that we've demonstrated in the past in Hawaii, and we think there's significant opportunities to run the way we did in June, kind of year-round in in uh, Montana with uh, with uh, some investment. In addition to that, we'll also be looking at building out our logistics system. Um, we also continue to grow our retail system. We've got a couple of uh, new to industry sites that will be opening um, this year, one in Hawaii and one in, in uh, Washington. And then, of course, we'll be investing in renewables around our existing footprint. Um, in addition to that, I mean, obviously, we're looking at extending into other communities within our market, but that's not something that um, we really look at unless uh, unless an opportunity pops up. Um, and we'll take all of that into account and at the same time give consideration to um, our, you know, our uh, authority to repurchase our stock as well. Great. Thanks for all the color and congrats on the strong results. Thank you. Our next question comes from Neil Meadow with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, Bill, team, I'll add my congrats to you. It was a really strong start to the year. Um, and this kind of leads to my first question, which is, you know, you've talked about a mid-cycle view on a free cash flow per share or EBITDA basis in the past. Can you talk about how that view is evolving in light of execution in the margin environment and how how can we frame what a, a, a blue sky could look like for the business a couple of years out if you continue on this trajectory? Yeah, I think I think one way to think about it, Neil, is um the the mid cycle that we quoted was kind of based on a fifteen nineteen average. And it was also based on an acquisition case in buildings of fifty thousand barrels a day. Um and um We've noted in the past that if we can get our utilization, our throughput up in building by 1,000 barrels a day, I think that added close to 10% of the net present value of, of our valuation of, uh, of buildings, or close to $30 million in net present value, if you think about it in the context of the purchase price for the steel. So there's a real opportunity for growth um, associated with getting our throughput up. And we've increased our throughput in Hawaii, and that, that actually adds value as well. I think the averages as well, uh, if you think about that 1519 average, we've improved our capture in Hawaii, and I, and I don't have the number in front of me, Sean may have specifics, pretty materially over that average as well. Um, I think that that also was, we took that into account in some extent, but I think we're actually capturing more uh, value in Hawaii than we did um, when we quoted that through that uh, mid cycle, so I think there's improvement on the to summarize improvement on the Hawaii side, improvement on the Montana side, both very achievable and within our control. And then overall, uh, we'll wait and see what the market uh, gives us. Mm, that's great. And that's a, the follow up is just talk about Hawaii. It's a unique market. It's a niche market. It's tied into uh, it's tied into Singapore, where there's been some strengthening of margins here. Just what are you seeing on the ground there? How should we think about the back half outlook for for that uh, that Hawaii business? 
the Hawaii business um, is strong, and it's been it's been stronger in the in the second half of the year. I think, as you noted, um, the first half of this quarter, we've seen improvements. I don't know that there's a major change in Singapore cracks, other than just following global cracks. I mean, Singapore has been right up against the ARB. Uh, with Europe. And so uh, new capacity that's been coming online has generally been flowing west to Europe. Um, and the inventories in Singapore continue to be very tight. Frankly, inventories globally are tight. And so I think local products, local production tends to uh, be directed toward local supply. The Chinese have, uh, you know, opened a couple of new refineries in the last uh, nine to 12 months, but those tend to be highly oriented toward the pet chem market. Um, you know, one of their more recent highly complex refineries, I think uh, it was 400,000 barrels a day, but only 50,000 barrels a day was actually going to transportation fuels. The rest was routed toward pet chem. And I think one of the things we're seeing is a, a fairly significant divergence between NAPTA, which is flowing into the pet chem market and fairly weak, and the transportation fuels in Asia, which, uh, and that spread is probably about as wide as we've seen in terms of if you just think about the gasoline NAPTA spread in Asia. Um, and I think that's a reflection of relatively strong demand for transportation fuels in Asia and, uh, and somewhat of a weakening demand in the pet chem market, which is driving NAFTA prices or creating a, a, a glut of NAFTA in the, uh, in the global market. Good, Bill, if you could build on that, what, how that ties into Hawaii, whether in the basis that you see in Hawaii yeah. relative to Singapore. Sure. Well, I mean, uh, again, we, we generally are producing transportation fuels for our local market. So we're, we're somewhat insulated from the NAFTA market. I mean, we do on occasion get a little linked and we export and um, that'll, that'll happen um, periodically where we have a bulk sale NAFTA. But for the most part, we're focused on, um, you know, using our reformer and our other upgrading capacity to take all of our intermediates convert those into transportation fuels and or uh, supplying the local heating fuel market or the energy market, the electricity market, as you know, there is, is fueled by fuel oil. So we're in um, pretty good shape and tend to, that, that tends to enhance our capture relative to the Singapore market. Thanks, Bill. Our next question comes from James Larkin with Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, this is Jimmy Larkin filling in for Ryan Todd. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. So I guess just continue on to Hawaii. Um, we've seen the landed diffs, you know, falling over the last couple quarters. What do you guys see as, like, you know, maybe the outlook in the back half of the year kind of going forward into 2024 for those um, landed differentials? You want to cover that, Will? Sure. So, so Jimmy, I think, um, you know, you're, you're correct. Keep in mind that the – Wide crude differentials operate on probably a 90-day lag. So the market conditions that were in effect, you know, in, in the 90-day period prior to the, the third quarter is really what's showing up in our financials. So I think um, in general, that's um, you know, I would say the uh, second quarter uh, was a period of, of time where you probably saw some excess physical crude length uh, out there, and uh, overall backwardation was relatively narrow. Uh, and, and ultimately, we, it was a, a good opportunity to, to buy in some crude and, and drive that diff um, down into the low fives. Um, I think, you know, obviously, the market's changed, I think, as you think about the Saudi production cuts that have impacted both medium sour and, and heavy barrels uh, quite a bit. I think um, probably most notable would be the, the differing, the unique relationship where you're actually seeing Dubai barrels trade at a premium to, to, to data Brent, which is quite unusual given the quality differences, but it tells you where the world is today. Uh, so again, I think you're, you're looking at a, probably a tighter crude market in, in the back half of the year than, than where we've, uh, where we've sat. Um, and uh, obviously very dynamic um, market. And, and I think we'll continue to remain flexible on our crude purchasing um, and, and ensure that we balance uh, and, and get the right barrels in at the at the best price. Um, so um, I think um, that's probably the the best guidance I can give you on on the crude market and the factors to watch. Sure, thank you. And then um, turning back to Montana really quick. So the capture was 134 percent in the quarter. Um, I know you said that this is highly seasonal, and obviously you know Rocky has been quite strong and. I'm just wondering, you know, with WCS kind of rebounding, even if we see Rockies moderate, what have you guys 
you know, you updated your kind of base case acquisition for throughput. Have you made any, you know, updates to kind of where you expect capture just based on that? Hey, Jimmy, it's Sean. Yeah, I, you know, I think our Montana capture long-term outlook is the 100 to 115% range versus the Gulf Coast 321. You know, the 134% uh, capture in, in June, and I would just refer to the comments I made about Rockies cracks relative to the Gulf Coast. We saw gasoline trade north of $20 per barrel premium to, to Gulf Coast in June, and diesel was $40 per barrel premium. I think since then, uh, gasoline's traded off in the Rockies by about five bucks relative to Gulf Coast and diesel um, north of $10. So still very, very strong cracks, both Gulf Coast and Rockies, but I think we're, uh, I think June was a peak. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Jason Gableman with Cowan. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, sticking with sticking with the uh, Billings assets. So, just to clarify, one um, is fifty-five thousand barrels a day a good kind of base case number moving forward on throughput? And then, can you talk about opex as well moving forward? Um, Eight dollars a barrel, I think, is below the acquisition case of ten dollars a barrel. What drove the difference, and and is it that eight dollars a good? number to think about moving forward. Sure, Jason, it's Will. Um, I think, you know, we, we gave you the, the third quarter guidance, which is 52 to 57. So I think 55 at the midpoint um, is, is reasonable based on, um, you know, where we sit today. On the OPEX side, the, the $10 per barrel number was based on a 50,000 barrel per day throughput number. So I think the majority of the improvement was really just driven by um, increasing the, the overall throughput. So. If we're down in the 55 range, you're probably in the middle there um, is, is probably the right way to think about it. So not a lot of, um, you know, variable spin there that moves with incremental throughput. So uh, obviously another factor when you think about the value we see in driving um, throughput up into the into the low 60s. Great. Um, and then my follow-up going back to Hawaii, it's been a beneficiary, I think, of elevated product tanker rates. Um, can you talk about the outlook for those rates moving forward? Have you seen them come come off at all? Um, what's been what's been driving the strength so far in the first half of the year, and and your outlook for the second half? Thanks. Sure. So I think on the product tanker side, yeah, you've probably seen the uh, lump sum movement of uh, MR ship from let's call it Asia into the West Coast, probably peak in the low you know three to three and a half million dollar range. They're probably hovering around $2 million today. It's been there for the last couple months, so it's been stable in that range, which is still um, elevated relative to history. Um, so again, I think that's, uh, you know, generally what we're seeing. And then, uh, you know, overall, um, you know, ultimately the, the price lag impacts that we saw uh, were, you know, we've had three quarters in a row of benefit of declining uh, crude oil prices as well as compressing diesel cracks. And as we've talked about the third quarter right now, you got quite a bit of strength on, on both crude and diesel cracks expanding. So, which is fundamentally positive for our business, but just keep in mind as you think about the, the capture dynamics, that is a, a factor that's been a tailwind for us for the last three quarters. Um, so again, that's going to move quarter to quarter, but overall um, still, I think, have very strong capture rates in Hawaii. You have a uh, sorry. Just to follow up on that, do do you have a rule of thumb how to convert that three and a half million to two million into into a dollar per barrel uh, as we think about the Hawaii benefit? I mean, I think it's embedded in the capture percentages, Jason. So I wouldn't give you a, a idiosyncratic rule of thumb to to, to uh, point to. I think there's so many pieces moving. I think we're trying to get you to um, a, you know a, a single point that um, mm -hmm. ultimately takes into account all the, the moving pieces that are um, in, in play. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Our next question comes from John Royal with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. This is Alejandra Magana on for John Royal. Um, we were just wondering, will any of the working capital impact from billings 
uh, reverse in future quarters? Hi there, it's Sean. Um, you know, we saw a, a positive working capital impact in, in June uh, in Montana. I mentioned that in prepared remarks. I'm not expecting uh, a reversal of that in, in Q3. If anything, I think we, we could see incremental benefits. I think most of the uh, working capital cycle flushed out in June. Okay, thank you. And switching gears, um, can you just provide an update on how the Laramie business is performing year-to-date and the expectation of a dividend in the first quarter of next year? Um, and how do they think about holding versus trying to monetize the stake uh, with where gas prices are today? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. Laramie's continues to perform well. I mean, obviously, gas prices have come off, but uh, they've got pretty good hedges in place, which tended to blunt some of the uh, some of the cash flows uh, when they peaked last winter, and uh, they're supporting the business now. Um, as I've mentioned in the past, the distributions are probably going to be less of a function of where gas prices are and more a function of whether we're drilling. Um, and we don't have a rig in the field right now. We are completing some wells, and that's going well. So I expect some production to come online for for the winter. Um, but uh, with the lack of uh, any uh, development drilling in 23, I think the expectation is there would be a dividend next uh, next spring. Got it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Manav Gupta with UBS. Please go ahead. Um, hey, guys, in the o opening comments, you mentioned some opportunities around uh, green hydrogen. Can you talk a little bit more about what kind of opportunities and uh, scope you're looking in terms of green hydrogen sourcing? Yeah, so, uh, Manav, thanks for the question. We're um, we're assessing an opportunity in Washington at our Tacoma facility um, using hydropower and partnering with the local municipal utility. Um, and we would be using that hydropower to uh, drive an electrolyzer to generate hydrogen, which then would be used to supply the hydrogen necessary for a sustainable aviation fuel facility. Just we think it's clarify. an attractive location given the, given the cost of uh, the hydropower. Just a clarification, who will own the electrolyzer and who will operate the electrolyzer? Will you do that or would you hire somebody to do that for you? Um, we're still assessing that, but we're, we will certainly be an equity participant uh, in that uh, electrolyzer. We may bring in a partner. We're still considering our options with respect to the development there. But it's on our property and it'd be adjacent to a sustainable aviation facility, a uh, fuel facility, and we'd be operating both units. That's that's absolutely great to hear because we do think there is a lot of scope for green hydrogen eventually for you know sustainable aviation fuel or even RD. So I'm I'm glad you are taking the uh, leadership role in that. Uh, I have a quick follow up for you. Um, Billings also added some logistical assets. So how should we think about the logistics segment EBITDA run rate going forward? Want to cover that, Sean? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Manav, it's Sean. Uh, we've signaled $35 million of logistics contribution from, from the Montana system, and that includes the refined product uh, terminals, our crew pipeline, and the refined product pipeline that runs from Billings to eastern Washington. Thank you so much. Our next question is a follow-up from Jason Gableman with Cowan. Please go ahead. Yeah, hey, I just wanted to ask about the status of the Hawaii SAP project. I know you laid out some uh, return metrics um, on the last call. Just wondering how, um, if if uh, those metrics are, are, are still fair to think about as you progress the project, and uh, specifically how, how you're thinking about um, feed acquisition. Thanks. Sure, Jason. This is this is Will. Um, I think the the return ranges that we gave you uh, in the past, I think, still hold today. So again, I think we're targeting uh, an IRR in the forty percent range, uh, and ultimately we're we're targeting to, to sequence having the SAF plant um, online in twenty twenty five in conjunction with the Hawaii uh, broader plant turnaround. So again, uh, a lot of work going into that today uh, on feedstock sourcing. Uh, again, I think. Um, 
you know, we think we're in an advantaged location, um, largely uh, because of the oil seed opportunity in the state of Hawaii. And then also, um, we believe we've got some advantages in sourcing uh, waterborne feedstocks from um, Latin America. So again, I think that's ultimately going to be um, the, the solutions that we're thinking about for uh, our feedstock strategies in Hawaii over time. Got it. Thanks. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to William Pate for any closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and thank you to everybody for joining us today. I want to congratulate our team on an excellent quarter. There are a lot of opportunities within our portfolio, and we look forward to sustained future growth of our earnings profile. Have a good day. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>